a cover loud. <laughs> Let's go. I'm on a journey to discover the truth. Living life and recovery is lovely. You got the power in you. Surround yourself with positive energy. Judges hitting people with provocative penalties. Need to make a change. Advocate to change the laws. Prove the people that it's not insane. When you stand behind a cause, I'm here to speak about the pain. Recover loud to normalize the disease that's been killing all my friends and my family. The time is now to let it all go and recover loud. The benefit is healthy people, family and friends that never have to overdose ever again never have to plead out to a lesser offense i'm proud to say that i recover loud i never thought i could but i'm so proud that i discovered how to live my life again controlling my own destiny i needed recovery i still need it desperately addiction never defined my identity. i recover loud here to tell my own story i recover proud save a life of like 40 i recover loud yeah i recover loud i recover loud yeah I recover thou, I recover thou, here to tell my own story. I recover proud, save a life of like 40. I recover thou, yeah, I recover thou, I recover thou, yeah, I recover thou. I recover, I recover loud. 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 Liz, welcome to the show. Thanks for sharing your story with us today. Um, can you start out telling us what it was like uh, for you growing up as a child? Well, I actually grew up on Madawaska Lake, which is about 15 minutes away from Stockholm, um, which was pretty nice as a kid um, living right on the water. Um, so I had a lot of adventure time. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, my family and I, we um, experienced something quite traumatic um, that affected us all pretty um, deeply um, and at that time like a lot of things you know people didn't really know how to deal with things like this you know really mental health and stuff like that wasn't really something that was really talked about at least not in my family it wasn't you know it was kind of that you you just kept going you know you got through what you kept going um, and you know we thankfully over the last you know years of my recovery journey and my family um, we've all kind of healed together really so um, you're all in recovery today well um, in a way yeah yeah different kinds of recovery but yes. yeah we're all kind of every day <laughs> you know yeah so. and, and years ago it was important to try to protect the image right you know um, yep. these things don't happen to, to our families right. um, you know and and, it, and it's a sad sad truth that you know not being able to share that with people not being able to get that support from others right. um, or be of support to other people you know and uh, that's I mean that's the basis of recovering loud you know because today we, we know that there's no better help like somebody who's been through it well and that's a, that's you know that's the the biggest part of recovery is having people who know exactly what it is that you're going through. I was terrified to ever talk about what happened to my family or whatever happened with me because I didn't want to be judged. Yeah. 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 At the end of the day, you know, every family in Ursa County, you know, everybody has their own issues and their own problems that they deal with. And I think sometimes we forget that we are all human yeah, <laughs> and we exactly. all make mistakes and a lot of us could all relate with a lot of the struggles that we all go through every single day. Um, you know, and, and if we could all just kind of be that listening ear instead of the judging eye. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, we all struggle with something. Right. And, uh, you know, nobody goes through this life perfectly. Right. Um, you know, and uh, it's it's how we go through life, how we deal with those problems as they arise that really build our character. Yeah. Um, me, I, I learned to hide. I turned to substances, um, which at some point you must have done. 
That's um, exactly what I did, yes. <laughs> um, so at what age did you first start using something? Well, um, I was probably 12 or so when I started, you know, kind of understanding what marijuana was, started smoking marijuana, um, which kind of led me into drinking here and there, and then I started smoking cigarettes, and it was really made when I got into my freshman year of high school, and I kind of had this anxiety, depression meltdown, and I had no idea what I was going through. I didn't understand it. All I knew was I just didn't want to leave my house. <laughs> yeah. I was really young, you know, and I couldn't, I didn't understand what it was I was feeling, but just that I was terrified. Um, so I ended up actually homeschooling my first year of high school. And that was, that was kind of really a dark, dark year for me because I kind of just isolated because I didn't know how to deal with it. My parents tried to obviously get me into counseling and things like that and wanted to start me with some mental health uh, medications and stuff. But Did that happen? or I tried, I tried some medication for a little bit, but then I didn't want it, you know. Um, and then I kind of, I worked through it, and then my sophomore year of high school, I went back to school. And that's kind of when um, prescription drugs became a big part of my life. Um, you know, I remember the first time I tried a drug, I thought, this is the feeling that I've been looking for. And I found happiness. You know, I found this thing that made all my problems go away, and all these feelings I was feeling I didn't understand just disappear. You know, and I grew up in Stockholm. I had no idea what the stuff was or what it did. I just right. was with a group of friends, and we did it, and that was that. Yeah. Um, fortunately for me, though, I, I was able to kind of not get so wrapped up in it. Um, somehow, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. I watched a lot of people that um, I went to high school with and that were my group of friends go down a completely different way with it. Um, so I'm very grateful that that, you know, I did experiment it with it, and I started it, and I think it's what kind of led me into my main problem, which is alcohol. Yeah. Um, you know, once I hit college, I kind of just felt like, well, I can't be doing the illegal drugs anymore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You know, my degree was criminal justice. Um, so I really kind of was thinking, well, that's not why, so I'll just stick to drinking. Because um, drinking is, you know, socially acceptable, and right. a lot of people do it. Um but it was not good for me. Um, yeah, no. Alcohol kind of turned me into somebody I didn't even recognize. Um, and I didn't really start getting bad until after I turned 21. I started blacking out. Um, I wouldn't remember what I did or what I said. Um, I would have people telling me the next day the things I said to them, and I would say horrible things to these people. Things that I couldn't even, you know, the things I would do and... You can never take that stuff back once you do it. Um, and for a while, like, I was okay with it because I'm like, oh, you know, everybody gets blacked out and drinks and has a good time, and that's, you know, that's not a big deal. Um, but it turns out being that eventually, after a lot of trials and errors, <laughs> I, yeah. I realized it's it was the alcohol that had to go, you know. Um, can I ask, um, where did you learn to drink like that? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question, Mike. Um, well, you know, drinking was a big thing in my family. It was. Um, you know, my parents would come home from work and they would drink. And when we go on vacation, it was good, you know, drink and have a good time, those kinds of things. And I think I just, I wanted to have way more of a good time. <laughs> For yeah. me, I couldn't stop. Yeah. And see, when I, I started drinking at 12, and it was at family functions. Yeah. And I wanted to be like my aunts, aunts and uncles that lived on the lake and had the boats. And, and um, you know, they would drink every weekend from the time they got up, yep. you know. And um, so I learned that drinking was, you know, as much as you could drink until you threw up or passed out. Yep. Um, and then as I got older, you know, that caused me a lot of trouble, you know. Uh, being at the bars in Canada, passed out on the bar. Um, <laughs> You know, until last call when I was woken up and handed the keys to drive back, you know. Um, those crazy things happened, and I didn't know that I was drinking wrong, you know. Right. I, uh, I felt the same way. Yeah. I felt like I was doing what everybody else was doing. Right. You know. There and was no difference. Right. So when did you notice that it was a problem for you? Well, um, I think I knew for a while. I think you start to understand after a little while that you, then you start to justify it in your brain like you know it's not right but then you're like well no well, you know um, probably by the time when I graduated um, college and 
I started to black out almost every time I was drinking. And the things I would say become more hurtful. The things I would do would become worse. And I was driving my vehicle home, and I had no idea how I got there. Um, you know, who knows the people that I'm very thankfully I have it, but I could have hurt driving my vehicle like that. Yeah. We know that, um, you know, quitting alcohol cold turkey can cause, lead to seizures mm -hmm. um, and be dangerous for people. Did you have any problems when you quit? Because the big thing for me was like, it wasn't like, it was getting there. You know what I mean? I hadn't. I was always a, a binger, more than I was an everyday drinker. You know, but it was getting to that point. It was getting so bad to that point where it was either I had to find another solution or I was going to end up, you know, having to drink all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, and I remember like when I got sober for those two years, and I didn't have a program and had anything like that. I just kept thinking I can do this and I'm fine. Um, the reality of it is, is that bad things keep happening in yeah. life. You know what I mean? Not yeah. every, not everything is always happy, no matter what situation you're in. Right. Um, Getting rid of the substances don't doesn't make the world no. stop. It doesn't. <laughs> so I realized that the hard way. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was how I learned how to cope with my issues. So when that relationship fell apart and, and bad things happened, I thought, what's going to help me get through this? Well, the alcohol. That's what's going to help me get through this, you know. Um, and so the drinking became a real issue, and I ended up, I, I quit my job with AMHC, and I decided I was going to go get some help. So I ended up in rehab in Florida, okay. and um, I wanted to get as far away from here as I could because I blamed here. It was Arusa County. It was this place. It was, I soon realized it was me, and that it wouldn't yeah. matter where I went, it was going to still, I follow myself, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I actually helped um, you know even my own kids understand that yeah. you know if if there's a jerk everywhere I go, That's chances are I'm the jerk. Right. You know. Yeah. So, um, so what led you to choosing Florida? You just wanted to get out of here. I just here. wanted to get out of here. I just yeah. thought that it was here and it was the place and it was the people and it was you know I just wanted to get as far away from here as I could. Because you said you worked at AMHC, so you knew that there were. Resources. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew that, and and I knew that there was AA and all those things, but I didn't feel like I needed that. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, little did I know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and and the and the rehab in Florida was really it was nice, and they did a lot of deep um, therapy work with me, and there was a lot of things I gained from it. Um, but I also didn't want to come back here, and I ended up staying down there for probably a year, and. Um, I got myself involved in the same kind of toxic relationships, just different, you know, mm -hmm. trying to save this person and help this person and, and right. you know, not understanding that it was me that I needed to work on, not anybody else, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. When, when we're unhealed, healed, you know, we can't help other people heal. Um, you know, my experience in, in rehab was uh, kind of similar to that. Um, I read every book that we had you know I went to every meeting and I spoke at every meeting and I could tell every person there what their problem was oh yeah you know yep um, but not mine <laughs> but you know three months into my rehab I was asked to leave because I just wasn't getting it yeah. you know um, and it was more hurtful to other people and at first I didn't understand that I yeah. was so mad at them you know mm -hmm. um, and I later understood you know the lesson that that honestly that's what I needed I needed to be humble because Mike wasn't any better than any of those people exactly. there right you know I was struggling with the same issues they were um, and I just I couldn't accept it at that time yeah you know? that was a bit that was a hard one for me too yeah. to humble myself was really hard yeah and I I understand um, someone's rehab uh, program is is their own and it's personal but is there one lesson that you learned um, you know, through that process that, that really made a big difference for you? Honestly, it was about probably learning that other people were going through the same thing I was. You know what I mean? And the meetings. The meetings and in, in were amazing. I remember feeling such a connection. The first AA meeting I went to or the first NA meeting I went to with all these people. Yeah. And you could just feel it in that room, you know. Um, that was probably the biggest thing for me was knowing that I'm not alone. Yeah. You know, I'm not alone in this. And... It's okay to talk about it, you know. Rehab was huge for me for that, and just to even have a place just to heal, yeah. you know, and to be vulnerable. Um, you, you know what I love about that lesson in particular is 
you know, when it comes to understanding and accepting and forgiving people, when we can accept and understand that they're also struggling with some of the, the same things that I am, it makes it a hell of a lot easier for me to accept, forgive, and move on. Yeah. Um, because we're all sick in some way. Exactly. You know, and if we just assume that that person is that way because they're a jerk, then there's no hope for that person, right? Yeah. Um, if we understand and believe that there's something that that person is struggling with, we can offer a solution. We can lend an ear. We can be support, and things can turn around. Right. You know. Um, so. Uh, you went to Florida. Yes. Uh, you went through the rehab. Yes. And you've been sober ever since? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, so what happened there? So I ended up in another really bad relationship, and my car got stolen. And I ended up in Miami somewhere, and my whole life down there fell apart, and I ended up having to come home, pretty much. Um, which was awful for me at the time. Yeah. Um, <coughs> you know, um, I drove home. And it was an amazing experience, really. It's a long drive, but it was a beautiful drive. Yeah. Um, but I was terrified the whole way here because I knew, I, well, I assumed there wasn't going to be any kind of recovery up here the way there right. was there, um, which is different, obviously. Um, but so I kind of came home with my tail between my legs, and that was really, really hard for me. Um, I didn't get back. I, I found the AA meetings and the NA meetings and things like that, but I kind of stayed away from that, and I tried doing the whole, I'm going to just deal with it on my own. Um, and then I, I still just couldn't, I couldn't get out of my own way. Yeah. Um, and the drinking started again when I came back home, and it started causing issues again with my family and everything. And I basically got to the point where I wanted to die. Um, that was where I was at and with my life. Um, and I remember the night exactly when, <laughs> you know, my dad is one of those people that was like, well, let's just go to the camp and you can heal up there. And I said, no, I can't. Mm -hmm. No, I can't. I need to go get some real help. Um, and so I did. I, I had my dad drive me to Fort Kent Hospital, and I told him that at this point it was either drink or die. I don't, you know, I'm just over, I'm over it. I'm tired, yeah. and I don't want to do it anymore, you know. And um, speaking of humbling myself, I went to, um, shortly after that, I ended, up, I ended up staying in the psych unit for probably about a week or so, and they were really great there. Um, I got out, and of course I spent that whole week before going to the rehab in Limestone, getting wasted as much as I possibly could. <laughs> Which is, I mean, the things I would tell my family that I was going, I'm going for a walk. And I go down to the store and I get a fifth of Captain Morgan, drink it, and keep walking. And it was just, the insanity of it is just, I still don't understand it to this day. But um, I ended up um, getting referred to the farm and um, that program was amazing. It really was. Um, the rehab in Florida was fancy and nice, and we had a pool and all that, but the, the limestone, the farm, the program there, it was, you know, they gave me all these books to read, and all this literature about alcoholism, and, you know, and what that looks like, and what you're experiencing, and what you're feeling, and it was just so educated. I took it all in this time, and I think that's a big part of recovery, is you really have got to take it all in. You really got to want it, you know. Um, I took it all in. And I, it made everything start to click. Okay, all right. Well, this all makes sense now. We're going to take a break, catch a word from our sponsors, and then when we come back, we're going to find out what's keeping Liz sober today. Welcome to Rick's Redemption, where we are family owned and operated. We strive in cleanliness, honesty, and customer appreciation. Rick's Redemption is a recovery-ready employer who believes wholeheartedly in redemption. Here at Rick's, we support Recovery Rustic and definitely are proud to recover loud. God bless. Um, Liz, so now you've found recovery, you're doing well, and life just became perfect for you? <laughs> It did actually. I mean, I, I, you know, I felt really great, and I had, um, I had reached my first year of recovery, and um, the next day, actually, after my first year, I found out that I had a rare tumor that was cancerous. Um, wow. So my whole life at that point turned upside down, um, and this is really the part where my recovery changed a lot. Um, 
I kind of started to have a deeper connection with God. Um, and honestly, I believe, and for me, um, God is what got me through my cancer. God is what got me through, you know, not wanting to use or drink during that time. Um, you know, I had met John at that time, too, um, my husband John, and um, he was just amazing through all that. He never once um, left my side, and, um, you know, I believe that God had him there with me for that reason, um, yeah. you know, to have that support, and um, it definitely made things different for me, because as much as I loved AA, I couldn't go to the meetings and feel the same anymore. I felt different. Does that make sense? Like, I just didn't feel like I could talk about, you know, I could talk about drinking all day long, but I couldn't talk about what I was going through then. I mean, because it was cancer. It wasn't alcohol, you know. Um, so John and I quickly found, we really found this group of um, people that are believers in Jesus and things like that. And we had started having Bible studies and kind of, you know, diving deep into all the scriptures and things like that. And that really touched me and help me um, get through a lot of that uh, pain and suffering. Um, cancer is a scary thing. <laughs> um, Absolutely. You know, I was told that, you know, we, the answers are still, there's still a lot of unknowns about what it is that happened. And, I mean, I was 28 years old and all this went down. Um, so um, the surgery was really massive. I had to lay in bed for six months. Wow. Um, you know, and then my body completely changed after that. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I, the pain I experience today is all day, every day. Um, you know, but I was able to stay absent the whole time besides, you know, um, the pain medications for up the surgery, but it was hard. It was hard. Did, did you have any troubles uh, using your pain medication? Did, did you have any, did you struggle with it mentally? Were you, were yeah. you fighting with yourself? Yeah. Oh, it was bad. Yeah. It was bad. Um, I actually called, I had to call one of my doctors and say I can't. They, of course, the strongest medication, which is Oxycontin, which is one of the things I really tampered with. Um, and I told them I didn't want it, but that's what they send you home with, right. you know. Um, I remember I had to call one of my doctors and say, listen, I just can't take this. Send me something else. I don't care what it is, but I can't. Because I started to get to the point where, oh, I could take it a little bit earlier. I'm in a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. You know, I could justify right, it. Justify um, it. But I was able to calm myself out, um, yeah. which is... I was proud of myself for that. <laughs> yeah, and honestly, that's the best thing we can do for ourselves is when we notice something, you know, we're going to be the first one to know. We yeah. There's nobody that knows us better than we do. Yeah. And if we have that ability, that insight to um, to really recognize where we're going, you know, and then we can start thinking about, you know, what is, is the end result, you know? What's my motivation for doing it, yeah. you know? And if the motivation is right, um, then it's okay to do what we need to do, but when that motivation turns towards our addictive thinking, you know that's when we have to step back and really um, take a look at it and decide. And so for you to have that, that's that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and you know I'm sure you are at where you are today because you were able to to take a look at that. Yeah, and and I was able to deal with it in in the right way. And you know, also a big part of you know, a big part for me, too, is being able to give back. How do I give back? How do I show people that, yes, life can be hard and it can be tough and we're going to deal with hard things, but we can get through it, yeah. you know? And there's ways that we can deal with it without using drugs or alcohol or anything, you know? I, I, I don't, and I also believe that there's so many different ways that you can find recovery. Not one yeah. way fits everybody. Exactly. Um, you know, whatever is keeping you happy and, and keeping you healthy and, you know, that's the kind of way I see it. I wouldn't have saw that before going yeah. through what I've gone through, you know. Yeah. So uh, we're almost out of time, but can you please tell us, um, you know, about some of the things that you're doing today uh, to give back? Um, um, well, I, my husband and I are part of Recovery Roostick, which basically, you know, we help run the two recovery houses in Caribou. There's a man and a woman's house here. And we just try to find all the resources we possibly can for people in recovery. Um, and we don't care what kind of recovery you are in or um, what your story is. We just want to be able to give you all the resources we can. Um, and what are you getting out of that? Why do you do it? I just, I don't know. I love it. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel good that I can give back what I have received in a way. Yeah. Um, and for me, and as part of being somebody who really believes in Jesus, um, <laughs> that's kind of what you're supposed to do. You know, how, how do we help people who are in the dark? 
you know, and I feel a lot of people who are using or in addiction, that's kind of where you are. Um, you know, my life today is great. I have a daughter, which, you know, after all my um, cancers and stuff, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do that, but I am. I have a daughter, and I'm married, and I have a great family, and I have a life that I could never, I would never want to change, <laughs> you know, yeah. but that's because of everything I've been able to accomplish and my journey, um, and I want to be able to see that happen for as many people as I can. You know, and recovery rustic is just a little part of that. I believe when we recover loud that we reach more people because people aren't um, scared to share their story. Um, you know, and, and I think that makes a huge difference for the community, especially smaller exactly. communities. Exactly. Um, your experience is valuable for other people to hear. Exactly. Um, my experience is valuable. Um, and it's important that people understand they're not alone. Yeah. So uh, thank you for joining us this week, Liz. Um, Thank you for the work you're doing uh, with Recovery Aroostook. Um, you know, the work you do at home, you know, being able to raise your family um, and, uh, you know, just living today, you know. So I, I'm grateful that you put in the work uh, because it is affecting others and, uh, you know, we're all benefiting from you coming out and choosing to share your story. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Recover loud, everyone. Just got done talking with Elizabeth Holliberg from Caribou, Maine. Her story demonstrates that a person from any background, from any lifestyle, can experience trauma that will eventually lead to substance use disorder. We all deal with trauma different, and we all learn how to cope with our issues in the ways that we see others do it. Anderson's Auto Repair, locally owned and operated in New Sweden, Maine, specializes in all make, all model vehicle diagnosis and repair. Each individual service is backed by our nationwide TechNet, two year, 24,000 mile warranty. Call or stop in to schedule an appointment today. Anderson's Auto, for wherever the road takes you. Let's go. I'm on a journey to discover the truth. Living life in recovery is lovely. You got the power in you. Surround yourself with positive energy. Judges hitting people with provocative penalties. Need to make a change. Advocate to change the laws. Prove to people that it's not insane. When you stand behind a cause, I'm here to speak about the pain. Recover loud to normalize the disease that's been killing all my friends and my family. The time is now to let it all go and recover loud. The benefit is healthy people, family and friends that never have to overdose ever again never have to plead out to a lesser offense i'm proud to say that i recover loud i never thought i could but i'm so proud that i discovered how to live my life again controlling my own destiny i needed recovery i still need it desperately addiction never defined my identity. i recover loud here to tell my own story i recover proud save a life of like 40 i recover loud yeah i recover loud i recover loud yeah I recover thou, I recover thou, here to tell my own story. I recover proud, save a life of like 40. I recover thou, yeah, I recover thou. I recover thou, yeah, I recover thou. I recover, I recover loud. I recover, I recover loud. I recover, I recover loud. I recover, I recover loud.